wherever there is a second meaning with Dante, and you can you can think, uh, well, that's a, a cool coincidence. Maybe who knows if he thought about it? You can be sure he thought about it, hundred percent. Hello everyone, welcome back. This is actually the 79th video of the series of 100 videos for 100 cantos of Dante's Divine Comedy. Let's read uh, Canto 9 of Paradiso together. This Canto 9 where Dante is still in the heaven of Venus. And uh, it's a Canto 9 that can be read properly only together with Canto 8, only keeping in mind Canto 8 because they are uh, they, con they constitute a unity in the complex of Paradiso. And then, as I mentioned in the previous video, with Canto 10 of each cantica, Dante kind of takes off for a new dimension, for a higher dimension, beyond what he's been speaking about before. Also, I am personally looking forward to the next canto because uh, the great St. Thomas Aquinas is going to be introduced in the next canto. It's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And um, here in Canto 9, if we, this is a canto that if we read um, through very quickly and uh, without really, first of all, uh, knowing the local history, because there is a lot of uh, local contemporary history, and uh, without really trying to think of what Dante is doing, is trying to connect, can seem like a very dry, very uninspired canto. In reality, there is a lot of intensity in this canto. In fact, in reality, there is a lot of uh, Dante personal heart in this canto, almost to the point that, that, as my own opinion, I think Dante, when he thought about uh, his own destiny, his own fate in heaven, he might have been thinking that uh, the heaven of Venus was the one that was more, was the best fit for, for his own personality, his own uh, type of past and, and life and, and behaviors. So these are the reasons why I'm going to take a little bit more time in this video to um, comment as a general introduction to the canto itself and maybe a little less on the details because for what they are relevant and significant I'm going to try and highlight a couple of things but there is really a lot of uh, local history that might not make potentially our heart sing like uh, many other cantos. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, Canto 8 and 9 really go together. Only in Canto 9, Dante is uh, expressing directly the concept of the folle amor, il, uh, the, the crazy love, in a sense, which is uh, the, the one, the, the element that the heaven of Venus is most renowned for. However, as uh, I mentioned before, Venus really has two different uh, characters or personalities or, or influxes. One is this uh, influx on the senses and the lo on love from a point of view of the senses. The other one is from the point of view of the civic passion, which was Charles Martel. So only in Canto 9 we finally see this influx on uh, the senses. And so Dante will introduce to us, in fact, three characters, all of them uh, uh, who have been greatly passionate in their life, great lovers, but lovers in the sense of uh, passionate, and uh, they all had many lovers in, in their life. And that is already in itself a uh, first question that we should ask ourselves, um, because there is some uh, anti-conformist uh, uh, decisions that Dante put into this canto. Uh, after all, there is one uh, character who was clearly an ancient prostitute, and uh, we've seen prostitutes in Inferno, we've seen uh, all kinds of uh, people in Purgatorio. Why are these people here? In short, it's because Dante sees passion and being uh, more passionate than other people, let's say, because this is your, your heaven, your influx, uh, star influx, or we could say in modern words, this is how you're made because of your genetics, your DNA. You're just feeling passions more strongly and intensely than others. Not as a curse, something that you cannot do anything about, but uh, something that you can grow and uh, channel into the love of God and see also with joy as a, as a pure divine gift. 
Very interestingly, there is also a third theme that Dante plays with in both Canto 8 and 9. The two main themes, um, as I mentioned, are one, the civic passion, or passion for politics, and the other one is the passion of love. These two main themes, they are the themes of Venus. But uh, in, uh, in, in between the lines, both in Canto 8 and 9, you could see clearly this third theme, which is the theme of poetry. And now that we have politi political passion, we have love passion, and we have poetry, who does the, do these three elements uh, remind you of? Well, of course, Dante. Dante, these are the three main passions of his own personality, his own uh, psychology. So there is a lot in this uh, canto, eight and nine, in these two cantos, that is very, very personal for Dante and to Dante. How can we see that poetry is such a strong theme in this uh, Canto 9? Well, first of all, because one of the characters is uh, um, Folco or Folchetto uh, of Marseille, and he was one of the greatest and most famous troubadour poets of his times. So that's not a coincidence already in itself. Then we also remember in Canto 8, where Dante included a line from his own uh, convivio poem, his older poem that he wrote, that's poetry there. But also in all the other cantos, this is incredible how everything is so um, intertwined in the Divine Comedy. In all the other cantos of the Divine Comedy, where Dante focuses on love, there's poetry. There's always poetry, not only because this is poetry, but Dante is speaking about poetry. So just think about um, Canto V of Inferno, Paolo Francesca. What were they doing when they kissed each other. They were, they were reading, they were reading this uh, uh, book in poetry about uh, adventures and lovers, etc, etc. Then in uh, Purgatorio, uh, in the Terrace of Lust, we saw poets. We saw the poet Arno Daniel, we saw the poet Guido Guinizelli. So this is all almost one thing that is inseparable, the passion of love and poetry for Dante. So this is already something that, let's say, helps us put together, connect the dots between Canto 9 and 8 in itself. But then there's something else that I find really fascinating, and that is a sort of um, a watermark that Dante uh, included in Canto 9. And this watermark, Canto 9 and 8 as well, because this watermark is a structure that, um, again, if you read it too quickly, you miss it that has to do with the prophecies that these three or these four main characters, including Charles Martel, Charles Martel, Cunizza, Folco de Marseille, and Rahab, all of them give us uh, prophecies, little prophecies at the end of their encounters with, with Dante. And all these prophecies, or uh, admonitions, we can say, are against the, the people, the powers in, uh, within Italy, who were opposing the project of uh, imperial restoration, which was very, very dear in, to Dante's heart. In these days, when Dante was writing Paradiso, in fact, he was a guest at uh, the court or the villas or the mansions, wherever, of uh, Cangrande della Scala. There is a famous letter that Dante, or many letters, that Dante wrote to Cangrande della Scala. And after the death of uh, Henry VII, who was the person that Dante put all of his imperial hopes in, and he died, uh, Cangrande represented uh, another, or maybe the last hope that Dante had to reconst reconstitute that type of imperial power within, within uh, his Italy. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen, but uh, Cangrande was somebody who was working to that objective, to that effect. So everybody who was working against it is uh, being uh, not only put in a bad light here, but also admonished and uh, is having um, some negative prophecies directed at in these two cantos, eight and nine. If we remember, uh, Charles Martel was basically prophetizing against the house of Anjou that he belonged to. Cunizza is going to prophetize against uh, the Guelphs who were basically located geographically in the area of modern Veneto and that she actually also belonged to. She belonged to the powerful nobility of that area. That's where she was coming from. 
Then we have the poet, the troubadour, Folco de Marseille, who is going to um, who's going to also, let's say, prophesy and admonish in his uh, monologue, specifically against uh, the clergy, specifically against the papal clergy, in fact, the most powerful ranks of the church, So, which in his later life he actually belonged to. So there is not only this uh, scheme of uh, prophecies and, and a, a strong political um, stand from, by Dante, which is always the same, but here more intense, but also he uses this uh, rhetorical technique or maybe literary technique of uh, putting this type of um, invectives in the mouths of characters who come from the political party that they are actually attacking or they, they are actually admonishing. This uh, creates even more intensity, even more tension and conflict in the narration. Now, we've seen Dante putting prophecies in the mouths of his characters left and right, all over the Divine Comedy. So the prophecies in themselves are not too original. What's really original in this Canto 9, and this is actually highlighted by many Dante scholars, is this, the fact that uh, Dante very strongly uh, proposes three characters that are being saved because they are now blessed in, uh, in heaven, who seem to be uh, to have been behaving abandoning themselves and uh, giving way in their lives completely to their passions in a very intense way so it's uh, and then in a way that is uh, very explicit each of them will have a particular um, either statement or characteristic that shows us to us the readers that there is a reason why that happened to them. There is a reason that they gave way to their passions in their life, for which they are very joyful and happy even in heaven. So this is the original, let's say, position or original idea of Dante here, because it wasn't something that was particularly common in his contemporary theology. We will see specifically the words that each of these characters uses to highlight the fact that despite all of their past and their behaviors, they don't look at, at their behaviors with regret or with any type of negative connotation, but with uh, happiness, joy, and as a gift from God. And as a final point of uh, introduction, I could also add this, the fact that um, in general, I think uh, characters in literature who uh, make this uh, parable from people who succumb to passions May that be the passion of love, the passion of uh, war, maybe the passion of uh, wrath or whatever that may be, very passionate people. And then they make this parable into a growth, they grow as characters into something that could be holy, that could be very uh, wise, very mature, and sometimes even uh, saints. For example, like St. Augustine. St. Augustine is probably the archetype in of this type of characters because we know that he had led for at least a few years when he was in North Africa uh, quite the lascivious life and then only later on after his conversion he became the great Saint Augustine and there is a an intense fascination that these type of characters have on me personally I'm thinking for example of uh, a fantastic character in uh, the Alessandro Manzoni novel, The Betrothed, that I, I tend to go back quite often because it's just so wonderful. One of, the, of my favorite characters in that novel, if not probably my favorite character, is called Fra Cristoforo. And uh, uh, Fra Cristoforo is uh, a friar, a good friar, who is going to help the two protagonists, Renzo and Lucia. But uh, the interesting personality of Fra Cristoforo comes from uh, his past which is very interesting because uh, Fra Cristoforo was called Ludovico as a boy. Ludovico he was his uh, birth name and uh, he came from a pretty wealthy family, rich family, but he was full of uh, passions himself. He wanted to be a rebel. Everything that he did wanted to be a rebel and compete, uh, but he also was very righteous. So he kind of put it in his head that he wanted to be fighting injustice 
unfortunately, you know, uh, fighting injustice with violence. And so as a young guy, he was going around with his little gang, fighting what he thought was injustice with another type of injustice, which was violence. And one of his uh, servants was called Cristoforo. In one uh, type of uh, uh, physical fight that he get into, this servant called Cristoforo, who was very loving, who was very loyal to him, gets killed because of his fault, because of Lodovico's fault. And from that moment, Lodovico has his conversion, he changes his name into Fra Cristoforo in honor of, uh, of this servant that, that he used to have. And the story develops, but it's a really, really beautiful because you get to a certain sanctity, even if it's uh, always an imperfect type of sanctity on earth. And so you have this grown person who is full of wisdom, but who also at the same time is still conserving that edge of uh, those times gone by. And uh, that to me is incredibly fascinating to think about uh, the eyes that St. Augustine must have looked through when he was a bishop. And uh, those were eyes that still conserved all of his past and all the almost limitless passions that he gave into in, in the early part of his life. Okay, for what concerns the text itself of Canto IX, uh, Dante starts uh, a little strangely addressing Clementa, and Clementa was uh, Charles Martel's wife. It's actually possible that he met also her in their life, because as we saw, uh, he probably met Charles Martel in Florence, when Charles Martel um, passed through Florence and had a chance to spend some time with him. It's also possible that he met with uh, his wife. That's why he addresses her directly um, in this first uh, terce, da poi che Carlo tuo Bella Clemenza, beautiful Clemenza, mebbe chiarito, minarò l'inganni che ricever dovea la sua semenza. He told about uh, the type of negative things that would then happen to his uh, descendants. It's really an opportunity here in Canto IX for Dante to give way and almost cleanse himself for the very last time in the Divine Comedy of this um, earthly, petty hate that he knows he has in his heart. Hate for the Guelphs, hate for, for some Guelphs, the ones that behave in a certain way, hate for Florence uh, that he mentions later on. After Canto X, we're going to see that it's as already going to be a slightly different Dante, um, not anymore concerned with such earthly things. So that's how we should read Canto IX as the the final opportunity that Dante gives himself to still be a little bit earthly compared to all the other future cantos from here to Canto 33 of Paradiso. So let me highlight for you uh, the verses between 25. That's exactly where uh, Cunizza starts speaking to Dante. And uh, later on, 35 more or less. There are a lot of geographical geographic indications here. Uh, very often Dante uses rivers because that's like, that was actually a style and this is also the way that Virgil used to write as well. So he imitates, is inspired by that style. And here he talks about la terra prava italica che siede tra Rialto e le fontane di Brenta e di Piava. He's really talking about, uh, as I mentioned, the region that today is called Veneto. And that goes uh, more or less between from uh, Venice to um, Padova and to the region of Trentino. So it's a large region where uh, Kunitza uh, was coming from. She was coming from a really noble and locally powerful Guelph family. Kunitza had a certain fame. Okay, In her times themselves, she was known for being a woman who had had many men. And she was very passionate, very passionate uh, with her love, very generous with her love. That's how one commentator defines her in, in those times, generous with her love. We also know from local history that Kunitza, in the second or maybe later part of her life, she moved to Florence where her maternal parents were based. And that's probably where Dante either had a chance to meet her or knew about her because she was a 
pretty impressive, remarkable character. And she really converted and uh, everybody knew her in the last years of, of her life as somebody really pious, very generous, uh, magnanimous, and, uh, and, and just a, a, a very good person. This is, in fact, why Dante puts her in, uh, in heaven. So there is this uh, real conversion that happened during her earthly life. What's uh, explicit in, uh, in her monologue is at verse 34. At verse 34, she is saying, Ma lietamente a me medesma indulgo la cagion di mia sorte e non mi noia che parria forse forte al vostro vulgo. This is, uh, um, as I mentioned, the real original idea of Dante, to make these characters uh, uh, state explicitly that they are really happy about how their life worked out, <laughs> panned out. Um, she says uh, in Mandelbaum's translation, in myself I pardon happily the reason for my fate. I do not grieve, and vulgar minds may find this hard to see. Uh, in Italian, when she says al vostro vulgo, She's not really saying vulgar minds. She is saying uh, everybody, the, the people who knew her and knew her fame of a really passionate woman with a lot of men, they just, uh, we all know how people just like to attach themselves to stereotypes and never let go. That was a stereotype. But uh, uh, the point that she's making here as well is that God doesn't care about stereotypes. God sees the truth and the truth of her, of her conversion. Between verse 46 and verse 64, we have Kunitsa's prophecy. And in this prophecy, which is quite long, relatively speaking, she is uh, basically expressing three prophecies, three main, and they are kind of in a crescendo of intensity and, and brutality. The first one is the defeat of the Paduans in a battle that is going to happen after 1300. The second one is the murder of a great nobleman of, again, this uh, Padua region in, uh, in the modern Veneto. And finally, the famous betrayal by a local bishop who gave up some uh, uh, people to the opposing political faction uh, to be killed, to be decapitated. This is why the vat to hold the blood of the Ferrarese would be too large indeed. And Dante calls it la bigoncia, verse 55. He says, Troppo sarebbe larga la bigoncia che ricevesse il sangue ferrarese. The blood would not fit even la bigoncia. This bigoncia was a container in, uh, in uh, wood that was actually used for wine, but it was also used by butchers to contain the, to put the, the blood of the pigs. So there is a, a second meaning here. Wherever there is a second meaning with Dante, and you can you can think, uh, well, that's a, a cool coincidence. Maybe who knows if he thought about it? You can be sure he thought about it, hundred percent. So Kunitsa goes away, rotating, gyrating, dancing like everybody around here in Paradiso, and uh, we have this uh, other light that is coming closer to Dante. Now, have you noticed how faces, human faces, have disappeared? In, uh, from Paradiso. We still saw a little bit of a figment of a face in the previous heavens, in the lower heavens, but here we only Dante only sees lights because the light is brighter and brighter. That's another invention that is so powerful. And in this case, this particular light that uh, goes next to Dante, comes next to Dante, is qual fin balasso. I'm reading verse uh, 69. Qual fin balasso in che lo sol per quota? Fin balasso means like a pure ruby that is uh, hit by the sun. Now is the time of uh, Folco, Folco de Marseille. Folco de Marseille, as I mentioned, was one of the most famous, if maybe not the, the most famous, of the troubadour, uh, the troubadours, the poets in the Provencal language. And uh, after having lived a life of, just like Kunitsa, of passions, having many ladies, many women uh, in his life and uh, a really passionate and almost dissolute life because as we know from what Dante tells us, all these circles of poets were always places where the passions of love were uh, crazy. So that's what he did until a moment in his life where 
he also converted uh, to the point of uh, becoming a bishop himself. So Folco starts uh, speaking at verse 82, at, uh, where he says, La maggior valle in che l'acqua si spanda, the major valley where there is water and uh, it's between the opposed shores, that's the, the Mediterranean Sea. So he's talking about the Mediterranean Sea where he was born in Marseille. He even says about himself, Folco, that uh, he, um, let's say, burned with the passion of love so much that uh, even all these classical myth uh, characters who were famous for being great lovers or victims of love didn't burn as much as he burned in his life. So he is uh, uh, very self-aware about, about this characteristic. And here we come to the mirror comment of what Kunitsa said just before. At verse 103, he articulates the same concept when he says, Non però qui si pente, ma si ride. Non della colpa, che mente non torna, ma del valor cordinò e provide. There is a good sense in what happened to me, in the way I behaved, and uh, I'm not repenting, I'm not spending my time in regret, I'm spending my time full of joy for whatever happened and how, for how God led my life. Let's see how Mandelbaum uh, translates. Yet one does not repent here. Here one smiles, not for the fault, which we do not recall, because he's been uh, washed in the river, just like Dante in uh, in the Garden of Eden, but for the power, the fashion, and for soul. Then Folco is offering proactively by, own, by himself to Dante uh, to show, he, he's basically showing him uh, the, um, the most luminous of all these lights uh, of the souls that are in this heaven. And, uh, and this is Rab, who is a, an Old Testament uh, character. She was a prostitute in Jericho, and uh, she, you can find the, her story in the Old Testament in the book of Joshua, chapter 2. In short, she helped Joshua and the Jewish people with their attack and take of Jericho, and to destroy Jericho as well, by hiding two spies from Joshua's army in her house. And uh, therefore, then Joshua won the battle, destroyed Jericho, or conquered Jericho in their, uh, along their way, on their way towards the Holy Land. And the only house or the only person that he actually saved of all the town in the, in the story, in the biblical story, was in fact uh, Re Rahab. So she was saved for this reason. And for this reason, probably, she is the most uh, uh, luminous of all souls in, the, in this uh, heaven. But because she's not really uh, speaking to us here, the fact itself that uh, she is the most luminous is highlighting for Dante the same concept that uh, Folco tells us at verse 103 and that Kunitza tells us at uh, verse 34. So that is the point that Dante really wants to drive home. Folco's invective starts uh, at verse 127. He, this is his prophecy and it's all against uh, Florence. It's beautiful and uh, a little dark, uh, the way that uh, Dante uses Folco's voice to express his feelings, his sentiments uh, against Florence again. He says, La tua città, Florence, che di colui è pianta, this town is a plant, is the root of him, che pria volse le spalle al suo fattore, the first one who turned his shoulders to his creator, of course, Lucifer. He's not mincing words, he's going straight for the worst of the worst. Lucifer, Florence is the town where Lucifer comes from. Lucifer. And di cui la invidia tanto pianta. So even if Lucifer is prideful, and the pride is the main sin of the devil, he's also uh, famous, or notorious, for also being envious, and uh, Lucifer's envy, or the devil's envy, uh, theologically comes originally from the envy that he had for Adam and Eve. Florence is producing this fiore, this uh, uh, golden fiorino that had stamped on it the uh, shape of a lily, 
that was the il fiorino and that's why it's good to um, it's correct to translate it as the damned flower the gold flooring that had this lily stamped on it and that that was the entire point all the the majority of the clergy there and uh, including the pope and the bishops were so um, attached to material things and to money and wealth that that's the only thing they were thinking about the way that dante expresses this is that uh, per questo l'evangelio e dottor magni son dei relitti this is why the gospel and the fathers of the church are completely neglected by uh, by the church in Florence. E solo ai decretali, only to the uh, canon law, the church law, uh, is given attention. They only study the canon law to the point that those books are all consumed in their margins. That's, that's a beautiful, because it's through the canon law that uh, the clergy were finding those little legalisms that allowed them to become even richer and to satisfy their greed. This is Paradiso, though, after all. And so um, Dante ends uh, with a note of hope, with a note where he alludes to the beautiful Annunciation scene at verse uh, 138, there where uh, the Archangel Gabriel opened his wings in the Annunciation. Tosto libere fian della Volterio. Avoltero means uh, adultery, from the priest's adultery. Why adultery? Because it's, it's co he calls it an adultery because the, the vicar of Christ, who is the Pope, is betraying his spouse, and the spouse being the church. So he's, as always, Dante loves the church, but uh, doesn't love whoever is um, leading the church in his times. Um, I love, though, the fact that Dante concludes this uh, invective with uh, a note of hope, a note of positivity. And uh, there is a, another prophecy that this time is positive. We don't know exactly who will be freeing Rome uh, in this way, as uh, the hill of Vatican, where the cemetery will soon be freed from the priest's adultery. Dante doesn't say, and Folco doesn't say, once again, we remember the prophecy in the, at the very beginning of Inferno. You remember that he used the, ver, the term Veltro. And then there was this uh, Dux, uh, D, V, X, that he also used in Purgatorio. So Dante is always praying, is always hoping and profeti prophetizing about uh, somebody who can come. In this case, probably when he was writing here, Can Grande della Scala, and be that person who brings all these uh, fighting factions of Italy together with an overarching power, ideally the imperial power, in, in his opinion. This is Canto 9. It's, uh, I probably scratch only the surface of it, because uh, as you can see, another two, three, four, five readings, and uh, we would find so much more in, uh, in this canto. But uh, I um, I cannot just wait for the next one because I love St. Thomas Aquinas so much and uh, I would like to know more of his work before uh, diving into Canto 10 um, again, but uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be great. So for now, thank you. Thank you so much for following and uh, for all your comments and your support. Thanks again.